let me share a few things from from my experience, which I am sure, just to be clear, format wise, diverged quite a bit from what uh, you are describing in terms of best practices, duration of IV, et cetera. And I chose a clinical setting for a number of reasons, and I think we'll come back to a few of them. One was I wanted to make it as inconvenient as possible for me to use ketamine. So we're gonna, we'll come back to that. The second was I really wanted to standardize the experience and have the versatility that IV provides, which is not the case with hitting the golf ball with intramuscular injections. So I wanted to be able to, which I did ultimately, have the ability to dial up the rate of administration in the middle of, say, a therapy conversation with a therapist. And then at one point, I remember very, very clearly, dialed up the rate by about 20, 25%, and suddenly things got very strange. And there seemed to be a distinct lag between my thought, my mouth moving, and me hearing any sound, which makes it very hard to talk. It's kind of like having a delayed reverb on a microphone or a set of speakers when you're trying to talk. It's extremely challenging. And I remember saying, John, that was the name of the technician or medic who a former medic who was administering the ketamine as a John, things are getting a little bendy. Could you please <laughs> dial back? And he was able to dial back and then I could resume the session. And I, I wanted that type of ability to experiment. The session itself, and this is where I'd love to hear a bit about the setting. The session itself, there was an intake process and I was in a room sitting in a comfortable chair, recliner, effectively, big screen TV, and you got to choose your effectively, let's call it a nature video with scenes of nature with music overlaid. And I standardized on one Redwood video. <laughs> and, and I should say that was the first time I had ever watched a video in a any type of clinical or serious setting with, with drug administration. So I found that in and of itself quite novel. We can come back to the pros and cons of that at some point. And my experience post-session was, and we were gradually escalating dose. I mean, starting well below, let's just call it the minimum effective dose that you're outlining and then probably exceeding it by quite a bit by the end. And my experience after the session became a running joke with my girlfriend because I would always forget something at the clinic. I would leave my wallet. I would forget my phone. I would forget my backpack. I would come home. I'd put something somewhere, forget where it was. And it seemed like my short-term memory was just gone for a period of time. And that leads me to two questions. So number one, how common is that, that one experienced some cognitive deficit or short-term memory impairment for a period of time? And what does the actual setting look like in the clinical setups that you've supervised or observed? Is it in a blank room? Are they staring at the ceiling? Do they have eye shades on? Are they listening to music, et cetera? I've seen all of the above in terms of settings. And we've always used blank rooms, partly because what we're trying to do is to make ketamine available to as many people as possible and have the most efficient settings. So in our clinic, which is led co-led by uh, Dr. Robert Ostroff and uh, Gerard Sanacora, both experts in this work, it would look like a surgical recovery room with mm -hmm. a number of bays. And everybody has their own space. They're shielded from seeing other people by curtains and things like that. So they do have some privacy but the doctors are moving and the nursing staff are moving from patient to patient to patient in the session. So it, it's more of a strange, in some way, almost a communal experience. Not that people are wanting the communal experience per se, but, but it is a, a very efficient way to uh, deliver the treatment. One of the things about ketamine is that it distorts perception in exactly the way that you described. So some groups try to keep the level of stimulation limited. B 
because the more intense the sensory input on ketamine, the more you get distortions of the experience. And it is said by mentors of mine who worked the emergency rooms when when you would get PCP and, and LSD intoxicated people come to the emergency room, that the management strategy was the opposite for those two medications because PCP, like ketamine, causes distortions of the input. So the more input that you get, the more distorted things become. But with LSD, there's almost like a battle for control of your perceptual world. So when you put the blinders on and produce sensory deprivation, you tend to augment the intensity of LSD. You're withdrawing the organizing effects of the sensory world. And, and so you tend to have a little bit more stimulation in the emergency room setting with, with the psychedelics than you do with, with PCP. <laughs> Is there, let's see here. Well, actually, I think you answered the question. I was going to ask you, if, if cost and scale were no consideration, I suppose I didn't frame it this way. For the purposes of scaling, it makes perfect sense that you would want the least cost, the least, on some level, the least space required, the least training, right? You don't want it to require a four-string quartet or something. But if cost and scale were no consideration, do you have any thoughts on how you might design the setting? Would it be any different? I understand the point that you made, which I think probably applies whether cost is a constraint or not, about minimizing inputs. But do you have any other thoughts on what that might look like? It's an interesting question. My general uh, feeling about ketamine, like most clinical experiences, is that when the patient is comfortable and feels well cared for and supported, that outcomes tend to be better. So mm-hmm. the whole setting that you describe, a really comfy chair, a really relaxing video that's not too stimulating, privacy and quiet is pretty close to an optimized setting. And the video mainly because not much happens, describing a treatment where not much is happening during the infusion. If you're going to reactivate trauma memories or if you're going to reactivate alcohol memories, that itself is going to be a pretty engrossing intervention and and probably will occupy a a lot of the kind of sensory space of the infusion. It sounds like you had some version of that. Well, (laughs) the problem with video, well, one of the many potential complications with video is that not all content may provoke the warm and cozy feeling that you may be seeking. So I remember watching for the first time this video and it's like beautiful redwoods and rivers, kind of creepy, not creepy, but like minor tone melancholic music, which I didn't love. I didn't expect that or see that coming, but I was already kind of strapped to the seat and on the ride. (laughs) So I couldn't, couldn't get off in the middle of Pirates of the Caribbean Disney World ride. So I was, I was in it. But I remember at one point on a higher dose, there's this one scene that popped up out of nowhere. And it was just this, it was this fox, this little fox. It, it looked like maybe it was Patagonia or something like that. It was just sitting on this freezing cold beach. It was sitting on this sand and it just looked miserable. It wasn't doing anything. I was like, why is this fox here? It looked really unhappy (laughs) that was not conducive to uh, an optimal clinical experience. 